Well, this um, presentation was given at the Hub in September. So what I'm doing here is just bringing you up to date with what was going on out at the Hub. Um, we had a very small crowd there, so um, good chance to air it again. What I'm going to talk about is building with confidence. And I've taken a whole series of different sectors for it. So we're going to do a little bit around the repair, managing, consenting, contracting, and choices of what, once you've made your choices, what you might expect out the end. So it's going to take about 30 minutes, and I'm going to move reasonably quickly through it because to get through it in 30 minutes is quite a call. So wait on. What, what we're talking about here is scale. You need to know how big your job is before you can decide how you're going to do it. But, it, but in, essentially, if you're going for a new build, you're going to go back and um, engage at a much higher level. Okay, so you might manage the project yourself if you're kind of expert or if the job's not so large, but you're going to find that as you go to larger stuff, you're going to need your designer or your builder to give you a hand in that process, or you're going to go on as far as the design build package, where I'm going to come back to those towards the end of the thing and just define a little bit better what they are. But the main thing is that um, you need to fit the job to the size of the, the work, so you need the right people the right size job. So um, if we're going to repair though, it's the scale of the work which will determine if you can self-manage it or whether you would use a builder for it, or indeed if you've got to move on um, to use a more professional team to get things done. But for the repairs, which is what we're trying to target a little bit more in this talk, we're aiming towards doing some of the work yourself or getting someone in who can, as an individual, contribute to the project at the same time as they do whatever paperwork's involved. But the main thing is, um, always use a building contract and do your homework before you start. And there's a very good information in the MB booklets on that subject, particularly the one about um, doing, doing your homework, because it actually describes and gives you a shopping list of the various things that you might want to think about when you're going to go and get a contract in place. So it's a really useful guide, and there are copies um, on the website at the same time. Okay, so if you've gone to, the, to um, the larger repair or a rebuild process, you're actually going to um, work your way through making sure that you've got the right people on site. You may employ a project manager, although for a residential property, a project manager is a pretty big luxury because they're usually involved in multiple um, different aspects of work all coming on stream at the same time, and that's when you need somebody to juggle it over the top. So, less likely to use a project manager, more likely to go to a designer or a building contractor who will actually manage the job for you. An architect may get involved. The architect will bring more, more value to the job in the sense that you can always ask for a premium when you sell a house that an architect's put together. So you need to think about balancing those things out. But in the normal course of the repairs that are being done, it's likely to be the builder who's going to become the king person in terms of getting everybody else on site to do the work when they need it done. So for the repair, scale of work, think about the self-management of it, but don't take on any more than you would expect to be able to do in the normal course because it's just going to cause stress and there are people who are capable of dealing with those stresses in the normal course of their business um, and can bring a lot to the table. So whether you're repairing or you're building, you need to be quite clear um, about your method. Always use a building contract, that's the way it goes. Okay, if you're going to a smaller contract, that's under 30,000, and 30,000 is the threshold when the law changes the requirements on the contractor. At 30,000, he's going to have to do a lot more paperwork, and below that, he doesn't need to do the same level of paperwork. But for small jobs, you need to gather the scope of work. It's really important to get the um, scope in place. For the larger contract, the, the, um, the builder is going to be required to do a whole lot of things off a shopping list that's in the regulations. So two of the key items out of that is a disclosure statement, which tells you where he's getting his supplies from and anybody else who might be sponsoring him. So if he's got um, a holiday to Fiji pitched at him from placemakers, if he buys everything from placemakers, he needs to declare that. Um, at the stage that he's going through that early contract process because you need to get a fair view of how he's bringing together the materials and the pricing and what might be included in the price. 
and whether he's paying a premium to get there. All right? And there must always be a written contract. And the written contract will contain a list of key information. That key information is also in um, a booklet that's available from um, MB, which I'll talk about again in just half a minute going forward. So the key things are disclosure statement and a contract in place. But the contract itself, there's a whole lot of things described that are needed around that. You need to use a lawyer if you think the things are getting complicated. It's important that you bring a lawyer to the table. They may not need to look at the documents for very long, but they will be able to run an eye over it and cross-check that what you've got is something relatively straightforward and that there's got no major hooks in it um, that might cause you any issue. They'll probably raise a few questions for you to ask in that process, so there's value add in that. Um, remember, you do need, don't need to do all the work at once. So for example, maybe you want to get the house leveled and brought to level before you go out and get people to price jib linings and painting because once the house is re-leveled, you might find they actually need to do more work in the house than you would do if you, don't, if you do it all at once. And if you do it all at once, what happens is that somebody's got to price the risk on the jib board into the job. So the guy who's lifting the house and doing the jib board is going to make an allowance for quite a lot of jib repair, which may not be necessary because when he lifts the house, he may be lucky and some of the walls will stay together and he won't need to do them. So there are, there are good reason to split the job up and get the processes separated out by trade. Um, so you might go to floor level and then you might go to internal finishes um, as a secondary process. Quite a good way of doing it. It also lowers your risk in respect of the amount of money you're going to have out at any one time, but it does increase your risk from the point of view that you're having to choose two separate contractors and so you've got the risk of those, that selection being right twice, which is a key issue. Um, one of the things that you could do is you could pull resources. If you know a friend who's also at the same stage in the repair process, maybe you could all get your houses brought to level at once and then get somebody to price all the jib board and all the painting. And you'll get a better price that way. And also, of course, you can share the issues of management of them going forward. So just think there's more than one way to do this work. And when it's relatively small, it's easy enough to package up with other people. Thanks. OK, so for the smaller work, that's under 30,000. The main thing is that you've got your scope worked out. So the scope of the work has come from your insurance company when they settled up with you. There should be a um, documentation around the cash settlement, what you um, need, know needs doing, because you know that there might be some things that you want in addition to what you've got in that list, but you need to have it down on paper before you start, because obviously when you come to price, you're going to have to work that through at the same time. So decide if there's any other work and set it out clearly in a single document. So the document doesn't need to be a fancy document. It can just be like a shopping list, as long as it's legible, obviously. But And don't use shorthand, which you would do with your shopping list, what we need is we need a bit of a list that says clearly what the items are that are to be priced. If, if on the scope of work that came from the um, insurance company it says 12 square metres of this, 10 square metres of that, you can add that information in. But if you add the quantity in, you must also check the quantity because you need to know that actually where the 12 metres is is accessible and that when you give this job to somebody, they will be able to do it relatively straightforwardly. You can't give them a half a metre here and a half a metre there and ask them to do it for the same price as one whole metre over there. So you need to be quite clear if it's all in one space or whether there's um, an issue around separation of different parts of the work. So you've got that all clearly in there. Now, how are you going to get a price? Well, for small work, it's not reasonable to ask eight or nine different people to price it because the cost of the job, say, at $5,000, and he has to put $1,000 into pricing it, if he only gets one in every eight, he's obviously going backwards before he even gets any work. So we would suggest that if it's under $5,000, two or at a stretch, three people should price the work. And that way, you'll get a competition so that the price will be as near as um, pressure can put on to get the right price, but doesn't put a lot of people to the extra work. You'll also get a better price from the two if they know that you haven't gone to eight. Right? 
Because if they go, if it's eight, you may get no prices because they'll walk away from the job. So it's really important to scale it down depending on the work. Where, where you perhaps have a little bit more um, price, so you're getting up towards 20 to 30,000 and you've got a number of different components to the contract, you might want to go to say three contractors or something like that. Because when they go out to their sub-trades, their sub-trades are also busy people. And so if they always use the same sub-trade person, you'll get the price that goes with that busy sub-trade person. So you need to go to more um, principal pricing people so that you get the pick of the various sub-trade prices inside the building contract that comes forward. And that will also keep the price down. But using three, or even stretching to four, is not an unreasonable thing to do because it will give you um, competitive tension, but it doesn't put these people to work that's disproportionate to the work they can win out of that process. In an open contract for hundreds of millions of dollars, you would expect to get 10 or 12 or so people playing in the field because the cost of the tender process is very small relative to the amount of work. But when you're right down at this level, you've really got to be careful that you don't squeeze down the bottom. This is the booklet we were talking about. This booklet's got a series of steps in it, really good. It gives you um, quite a lot of information about documentation. It also gives you the shopping list around what should be in the contract documents, which is on the previous slide. Remember, the Consumer Guarantees Guidance Booklet, this booklet here, is full of helpful information. Okay, And um, very timely it was. All right. Now, most people don't, in their daily life, come across contractors. So you've got two different approaches that can be taken. If you can, your best approach is to work on the basis of reputation, learning from others, and having a check on their subcontractors. That's probably the best way to get um, a good picture because the track record of people by word of mouth is generally a very strong indicator of good performance. So if you hear somebody who's just had house after house after house and this person's done it on time, round the right price, not too much scrapping, and you, you know everything's sort of working okay, then you're probably in the right place to be thinking about adding them to your choice of two or three people to do the work um, and getting them to price it. If you're starting cold though, that's much trickier because you have, you're, not, you're the first person who's going to give this person a track record and it'd be, you'd want to wonder why somebody didn't have a track record when they came along. Um, so, but people do start out and sometimes they give you the best service because they're the people looking to build a reputation. So you can't be too um, uh, cutthroat about finding somebody who's already done six because it might be easier to do than that. Um, but they should be able to give you references around where they worked in previous work, maybe not as the principal, for example. They might have been the, the leading hand on the site, and now they're out on their own. Um, so you need to have a look for scale of work. Don't take somebody who's only built garden steps to rebuild your house. They're not in the same league, and they know they're not in the same league. But if you give them a chance, they might do it. OK. So um, check the testimonials. So if somebody says to you, um, you know, Frida, uh, 142 such and such a street, um, had a really good experience with me, give her a call, here's a phone number, get on the phone, make the call, make sure that, that what she's got to say aligns with your expectation. And the other thing to do is to meet with the contractor. Okay? It's important before he prices the work that you meet him because if you eyeball them, you're the best judge of whether you're going to be able to work with them or not. Okay? Most of the people who work in the building industry are fairly straightforward people, and so it's fairly straightforward to come to a view about whether they're good or need, you don't want to use them to work with. Okay? And some of them have got websites, of course, so you can go back to the website and have a look at uh, where they're at. And the website might give you a tip about someone to ring. Remember, the builder wrote the website. You need to be thinking about how do you get the contra view, the owner view, into that process. All right, so we'll move on. Okay, so you may, you're getting to the starting point now. You're thinking about um, what you might do in terms of a contract and where it would go. Um, make sure the people come to site. So if you've got 
say, for argument's sake, we've got three people. To get those three people to come to site, you've got to be able to give them some documentation in advance about what they're coming to see. So you might send them the shopping list that we created a bit earlier, um, give them a bit of a, a feeler for it. You'll have talked to them. You've probably even met them. You might want to combine meeting them with them coming to site to have a look. But that's a little bit more risky because obviously you've got the issue then that they're starting to think they're in for the work before you've even decided that they are in for the work. Um, so you've got to be careful. So um, confirm your understanding of the scope. So here's the shopping list. Is there anything else that the builder thinks needs doing to get to your shopping list? Because sometimes you might want all the piles straightening under the floor, but actually he's got to take the floor up to have a look to do the piles. So he needs the opportunity to say, there's more work in here than in your list. We should itemise this out separately so that we can see what progress is being made and how we're going to pay for it later. So, um, so connected work must be identified because um, remember, you need, when you sign that contract with him, to know exactly what he's going to do and how much he's going to charge you to do that work. Consider how the job can be done and the impact on you. Are you going to have to work, walk, move out for six weeks? Are you going to move out for 12? Can he work round you? Does he like cats? Will he be willing to look after your pets whilst you're out of the house? You know, there are lots of issues that you can discuss with them that will help you um, get to a, an agreed position. Okay. Agree on the contract form, so you've got to know um, what form you'll use. There are a number of different contracts around. Most of the uh, places like Master Builders and others have got contract forms and there should be a standard set around. Remember, you're going to be able to check it against the shopping list that's in the um, guidance document to make sure it covers off all the items it should. Ask for a price to be itemised. Why are we doing that? Well, the point is that if he gets into the house and he's got to reset the frames in three rooms, but actually he needs to do four of them, You've got a bit of an idea about what the price for the fourth one is. If he just gives you a price of 30000 to do the whole job, how are you going to know how much of that belonged to any particular element that might be different from the elements that you already have in place? Okay, So it doesn't have to be right down to every nail. It just has to be down to a level where things might get repeated on the job. So if he's doing um, lifting carpets, for example, you might expect him to give you a price to lift carpet per room or something like that because that also helps you get to a certain price point. Okay, Ask for a timeline. That's, that's really important because what you're going to do, he has to commit in the contract. If it's over 30,000, he has to commit. If it's under 30,000, it's up to you to agree a commitment to a time scale because that's going to affect your other costs related to being either off-site or the inconvenience um, of having him working in the house and around you in the house. So that's really important. The, the next big thing that you must remember is you must always, always give every tenderer the same information. Right? So don't, um, when you're halfway through, decide actually you want the drive relayed as well and tell the last guy who comes along that you want the drive relayed as well without getting on the phone and telling the other two that you're going to want the drive relayed as well. Right? Why is that important? Because even if he's not relaying the drive and he's got to get a concrete truck in there, he may have decided he can only bring the concrete in one metre at a time so that he doesn't wreck your drive. But if your drive's being relayed, well, at that point he can drive the truck over as many times as he likes because it doesn't matter. So your price might go down. So it's really important that they all have exactly the same information. And you know how angry you'd be if somebody asked you to price one thing and somebody else to price another thing and then you chose the other person because they covered off what you needed and you didn't even get the opportunity. So it's about fair playing field. You must always make that come together, which means that when you meet with the first contractor, you must take notes about what you discuss because you've got to make sure that you cover the same things on the next list. Now, that doesn't have to be a whole lot of notes. Or it could be just a couple more lines on the bottom of the shopping list of work to be done, just as a reminder to you to talk to the others about the same thing going through. All right. Set a deadline for the price. Obviously, if you're getting to now, are you going to set a deadline for price before Christmas or after Christmas? All right. Maybe you'll want the price in in mid-December, 
I don't suggest you ask for it by 24th of December. That's a very busy time for builders. So mid-December, or then you've got to think about, well, I could give all this information to them and they can come back in the new year. Most builders don't take more than two weeks to price a job. Unless you've got Italian marble or something really special coming from overseas, they won't even start to tender it until two weeks before he has to have the price in. So there's no need to give them more than two weeks to price it unless there's some exceptional materials in that process. Okay, And back to this business. Check the printed guidance, the larger work, make sure you've got it all covered and read the contract carefully at that point. Okay, I'm just going to digress a wee bit onto building consents. I think um, there's a little bit of confusion around that, so um, just a few words on that. Um, if the work involves um, comparable materials, and these words are chosen carefully because they're in the, in the um, law, it is not complete and substantial replacement of a structure, then it may be possible for the work to be exempt. Remembering that exemption does not mean that the work doesn't have to comply with the building code. It only means that you don't need to get documentation through the council. The advantages of that, maybe, saves you a bit of money, and, but the disadvantage of it is that it doesn't supply you with the independent um, review that might be possible using the council. Now, for really small work, you wouldn't expect that independent review, A, because it's done so quickly, and so the chances of getting somebody out whilst it's being done is quite low, and B, the council is obviously very busy across the whole spectra of building going on, and so they need to focus on the work that's at a slightly higher level. So they're keen that small works is exempt. Um, where they're comparable, and where there's obviously no risk of um, the failure being serious. Okay, so um, if you're in doubt though, the council will be more than willing to give a guidance on it. So you could go into the council with your scope of work and the, the building consent officer at the bench will be able to say, look, this is really big, you know, it really does need a consent and uh, we're going on a different course if you do that. But if it's exempt, that's fine, that's the shopping list you can use. Now go out and find somebody to do the work. You could get that in writing also, if you want, by writing to the council, they will respond in writing, but it's all time, and it would take quite a bit of time for that to come through. So most, most of the small repair work will um, be okay exempt in that process, but all new work must comply with the building code. So exemption doesn't mean you can do a half job. Everything you do work to, you must bring to compliance. Thanks. Okay, if a consent's required, that's quite a different kettle of fish. The um, issue here is that uh, a lot more documentation will be required. So you need um, defined materials and work, and it needs to be quite well specified, because if the council are going to check on site, they need to have a very clear picture of what they're going to have to look at. So they need to be able to look at their documents and say, yes, that matches that. And the other thing is that when the consent is issued, that becomes the building contract. So the consent content is the work that will be done on the job. So even if that consent work is not fully defined, you could find that you get things done a different way from the way that you really want them done. So at that point, obviously, um, you're going, it's got to contain all the work and you're going to need decisions um, probably requiring professional input at that stage. Um, it would be unusual. Perhaps you'd be in the trade if you were going to do a consent without actually getting some professional input. Okay. So if the work's straightforward, get the builder might be able to do it. Um, and in a lot of cases, the builders it's quite happy to do that. Um, in the normal course of a building project, they would, would often be required to get the building consent, um, and they would have somebody who did the drawings for them, and they'd get a little bit of information together. They've probably got some standard specifications around concrete and roofs and glass and those sort of things. They'd put with it, and they'd put that into the council for consent. And they may include that in their price, but you need to know that it's included in the price. That's the key thing. Um, in that sense. Okay, so 
The council can assist you with the scale of the documentation. So if you go in with your shopping list and you take in a couple of drawings with it and you take a couple of specifications for the key things that you've drawn off the web, it might be um, for concrete, say, or um, it might even be for carpet or something like that. You go in and see them. They'll be able to tell you whether you've got enough information in the specifications to, to amount to a consent document or whether you actually need to do more work um, or get somebody involved to do that work. Thanks. So, which comes first, the builder or the consent? Well, it's about the, pretty much like the chicken and the egg, really. Um, if you go right back in history, the builder did everything. Now, nowadays, um, the consent is often done by somebody who is more orientated to the um, documentation side of things, and the builder uses his speciality when he gets on site. So um, defining the full scale of work will give you the requirements. So you will know roughly whether you need a consent or not when you get your shopping list and you know off the shopping list that there's these major bits of work and these minor bits of work. You'll start to form a view about um, whether it should be consented or not. But engage the builder um, first if you're going straight through a process. You're in that 30,000 to 50,000 range or you're doing a complete um, uh, rebuild, probably, you could use the builder to do the, the work. Only when you're getting to a lot of complicated bits and pieces would you need to go to a specialist like a, um, an architect or an engineer um, to get the consent documents done. Remembering that if you're working on the structure, you're going to need an engineer anyway. And if you're right back at the start where you've got to get the geotech involved, you're probably better to do it through the structural engineer, get him to bring the geotech to the table, and then use the structural engineer to get you through the consent process going forward. So um, they all have their skills to go with that. The major work then is going to involve consultants, and you can't avoid that, um, and you should make allowance in your price for that when the job's getting more complicated. With the most of the insurance work, there's been an awful lot of engineering work already done, and so you can be cautious about the need for more engineering input because that's usually defined the scope that's come from the insurance company. Um, and if you're at the point where you've got confidence around that, it can change your view of what needs doing. Okay. So, um, here we are. The cash settlement document should include all the details. So, this is back now at the closure with the insurance company when they're handing out the cash to you. You need to be quite clear about what it's going to pay for, and it should be paying for all the insurable action that's required, okay? Remember we said early in the presentation that you may want to add other items of your own to it, but you should at least have that shopping list. The beauty of that shopping list is that if you complete the work that's in the scope from the insurance company, then you should achieve an insurable solution going forward, right? because they're reinstating it to an insurable level. So it's very important to make sure you do include all the insurance work. That's the primary reason for doing the work. Um, consented or complex works inspected by your consultants. So remember, they, they are working for you. So you could say to them, I want 12 site visits, or I want six site visits, or I want a site visit before I make each payment, or um, you can arrange with them to, to do it. It will cost for every site visit, but you've got to decide how much assurance you need depending on how complex the job is. And sometimes it's better to commit to get quite a lot of that work done, that inspection work done relatively early. For example, whilst they're still bringing the foundations to level and getting floors level and doing those things, it's probably more useful to have the engineer come along and confirm things are right before they nail all the floorboards back down. Don't ask him to come after and ask him to confirm that the stuff under the floor is good because he can't get under there any more than the builder could in the first instance. So remember that. Okay, so um, the scope of work should be clear and keep photos of the work as it's done. The reason for that is that if the floor is opened up and work is done under the floor, when that floor gets nailed back down, how is the next person who buys the house going to know that the work's been done? It's really important that you get the photographs before you close the floor because then you can prove to people that the piling work was done under the house. 
and you can put those photos on the council record. You can, you can keep them in a box at home to hand on, but you can actually send them to the council and they are willing to put them on their um, building file um, further down the track. So first-hand observation of the work will show if the repair is being addressed, and that's common sense. You can, go, you can go to site, you can see what's going on, it will give you quite a clear picture. Um, your insurer will have defined that scope You've just got to be sure that you've got it covered in the, in the end. Okay. All right. A little bit on building contracts and payments. I don't think we're going to go far into building contracts, but um, it's important that we just cover off a little bit here. Okay. So short form contracts are available from designers, engineers, builders, um, architectural societies, engineering society. All those people have their own contract forms. They've generally been used a lot, so they've generally been quite well honed down to the important things that need to be in. You need to read them, and you need to understand what's in them. So remember, you can bring in a lawyer when you want to. All right. So progress payments, um, you need to decide if the project's going to take you more than four weeks, because obviously the, the, the builder has a cash flow issue. He's got to pay everybody he, who works for him. So... If you're going to go over four weeks, you need to start thinking about making the payments on a regular basis. Um, you can do a lump sum for a small project, but if you think it's going to extend, much better to be prepared to spread the payments out. Um, Pre-agree the timing of the payments, which is a really good idea, because it will save a lot of argument later on. And, of course, um, making sure that... Uh, the completion of a task is the way that you measure it. So instead of saying, when we get to 20% of the job done, we'll pay you 20%, what you say is, when we've got all the piles up and the floor down, we'll pay you the first instalment, right? When we get to the point where we're ready to paint, we'll pay you the second instalment. When you've finished the painting, we'll pay you an instalment, right? Rather than going 20, 40, 60, because the argument about whether it's 20 or 30% done it's quite hard to sustain, and it's much better to do it on a stepped basis. And provided you pre-agree it, it won't prove to be an issue anyway at the end of the day. Um, there is a consideration that you should perhaps keep a little retention back because you want the, the builder to come back to finish the job off. He's actually obliged under the law to come back and repair anything that isn't right in the first 12 months after the building's com work's completed and provided the work is over $30,000. So, um, but it's much better to be able to just have a little bit of leverage and around 10% is probably about right. 15 is getting a bit high, 5 would be getting a bit low to be any use um, on, a, on the size of job that we're doing. So uh, there. People have asked about penalty clauses. Um, my own view is that the penalty clauses are not really, haven't really got a place in contracts of this scale because it's setting out a relatively punitive process. There's one exception, and that is if the builder is giving you a timeline and you're concerned that he may not be able to achieve the timeline, he may be willing to give you um, some assurance around your off-site accommodation cost, right? But don't expect that out of somebody who's doing a $30,000 job for you. That's got to be up in the hundreds of thousands, really, before you can afford to have them carry that risk for you. Okay, so we, but penalty clauses create their own tensions. They also um, create their own um, arguments. So uh, we, I tend to steer away unless you're in a, a situation where you can quite clearly predefine exactly why you might want to have a penalty clause in there and the builder will has to agree in advance um, of signing up the contract because he may want to adjust his price, remember, in that process. So select the contractor on reputation will give you the lowest risk because <coughs> they've proved their track record and most of them are very proud about the work they do. So that's all good. Um, managing the money. Um, you need to make sure that you're going to have the money to pay the contractor. So it's a very good idea to set up a separate bank account with all the money you need to pay the contractor, plus 10%. Why 10%? Well, because there's going to be a few things you're going to have to pay for on top of, which neither of you realised 
need of doing that it's fair that you get done in the process. So allow a little bit of a margin around that um, and keep it to one side and don't spend it on anything else because once he's committed and you're in the contract, then you're also committed to making those payments and it's important. So get an invoice for each payment. So get the contractor to write to you or send you an email, but at least something documented that says, I am at the point where I have completed two floor level um, and I now claim my first 30,000 or whatever the number is. Um, so we need to have that process set out. Um, and record when paid and the total paid so far. So you need two columns, you need your, your when paid and you need the amount that's been paid as well. Because remember, you've got to make sure you've still got enough money in the bank to pay the rest of it. So be sure to check with each payment that there's enough to complete. That's, that's the other factor with the money. Be available um, avail and stress need to know how any additional work. Right, what does that mean? It actually means you want the contractor, when he's coming to site, to understand that you will pay him for any extra work he does. But you'll only pay him for any extra work if he tells you about it before he does it. Now when you think about that, that means you've got to be available to come to site pretty quickly because he might get to a point where he's got to take a rotten piece of wood out and it wasn't in the price and it doesn't belong with the insurance money anyway. You need it done and so you've got to rush around and check the, the, that that's the piece of work that he's doing. If you can agree a price, well and good. He might say, look, I really do need to take this out and I'll send you a, an account for it, but it won't be over $300. Um, that might be the way to get, keep the work moving forward. But um, it's really important that you get into the habit of being available to get that price, at least in the ballpark, before the work's done. And the reason for that is that if he knows that you are going to accept those sort of things, he will always bring them to your attention in advance. Because what we're trying to do, we're trying to finish this contract with no claims on the end of them. What we want is the figures to be right. And if you agree something, write it on the bottom of your shopping list that you've got for all the work that's to be done and make sure you keep the price in your list against the work still to be paid for and completed because obviously it's adjusting the price. And you'll know that how much you've got to play with and you'll need to be able to keep your numbers inside that. If you start to get worried that the thing is climbing outside, then you need to talk to the builder about what could be adjusted to bring it back to the price that you've got available, or you need to start thinking about where you're going to raise the alternative funds to get the job finished. You may not be able to adjust um, far enough to get you back on track out of it. But generally, you'll find it's because there's additional work that needs doing that wasn't discovered till you opened up the walls and, and there were things that needed doing behind walls um, that can be quite expensive. Right, um, be available, establish a pattern of pricing before the work. I can't, I'm coming back to this, I've said it once, I'll say it again. Every time you get an agreement about price beforehand, you can sit down and tick a box that you're not going to be fighting over it at the end because you will be fighting over it at the end if you don't agree the price in advance. Not because the builder's trying to do one over you, but because when he gets that price after the event, he has to rethink about what he did and how he did it and what went into it. And he'll build a price around that rather than a price around what actually needed doing at the very time that it occurred. Um, and keep your funds clear. Um, you need to be available for those variations in there. Okay. So, where is all this coming from? This little booklet is full of information. It talks about building contracts and progress payments. It talks about choosing a good contractor and signing a, the signed contract and what goes in the contract. And it talks about rights and responsibilities. So it talks about um, the fact that you have uh, some callback on the builder after he's finished the job. The job's over 30,000, for 12 months he has to come back if you can show him that there's something that needs attention. After that, you actually have to prove to him that it was a consequence of his work that he should come back and do the work. And he has another year when he has to come, he has to come back if you can prove it. Um, but it's a different level of proof. So what you want to do is make sure that in that first 12 month period, 
You've investigated all the things that were done. You've made sure all the windows open and shut and keep opening and shutting. And perhaps after eight months, you might want to run around the house and just recheck all the working things that should be working to make sure they are working um, so you can be confident that you're not going to need to ask him uh, get yourself into a position where you have to prove it. You can simply ask him to come and do the work. It's all explained in this little booklet, which is quite um, a good way through. Okay. Now, at the start, we talked a little bit about who you might get to do the work. And there was a seminar where we brought in the designers and the design build firm and the builders, and they talked about what they could do. But essentially, what you get from a design and build is a complete package that will take you from where you are now to moving into the house. Along the way, there'll be a lot of decisions you have to make, but they'll be related to hardware, carpets, colors in the kitchen, uh, level of cabinetry and those sort of things. But as a general, all the paperwork will be taken care of and you'll get an account on the agreed time and you'll pay that for the, the thing. So quite a good way to go if you don't want to have anything more to do with it than the minimum that you can get away with. The builder, if you engage him, he will A, um, not have the same level of um, professional office uh, support so he will work with you at the site. So, but he will be working to the building consent or the documentation, so it's relatively straightforward for him to either apply for that building consent or for you just to administer it against the building consent um, document. So you can go to site and have a look at them and say, yes, all those walls are back where they were meant to be and they've built the deck that they said they were going to rebuild and you can do that work through there. So a builder is quite a good option for anything that runs from full building through the top end, so the 200, 100,000, 50,000 bits and pieces like that, he, he'll, he'll run that quite satisfactorily. Now, if you're on the um, hills and you've got a really tricky site and you're wanting to retain views and you've got difficulty getting your car in the garage and you're doing a whole lot of other things, then you need the architect because the architect will do the spatial arrangements He'll organise so that the, the rooms work well. He'll organise so that the house sits to aspect, to the sun. He'll do a whole lot of other things that won't be done necessarily by the builder and will be done in a packaged way by the design builder. So opportunities there. Okay. Right. There are other options, though. For the smaller work, you don't really need to go to that level of um, expertise. You'll find a tradesman who can complete the work to the right standard. So you want somebody who's a licensed building practitioner, we call him an LBP, and he will um, undertake the work and he has um, responsibilities for the quality of his work and MB administers a, a board who control the quality of the work. So if there's any reason to complain, there's a complaints process in place for an LBP tradesman. And a lot of them are very, very good and a lot of them are aspiring to become building companies in their own right, so they're interested in making sure they get the documentation in the right place. Another option, though, is a quantity surveyor or a qualified draftsman. They'll come in at a, a lower level than the architect, but they would provide, say, they would get your shopping list into the right order, they'd probably measure up what was required on the job, and they could run the documentation through the consent process or generally provide a medium level of project management on the job. So they would fit into the middle group. Um, and we talked about the project management. This is really where it's going to be a, a larger job. Or if you've joined up with three neighbours and your three neighbours are all going to do work and it's all going to happen in the same sort of period, you might then say, OK, well, it's worth getting one project manager in to do the three jobs and um, that would be money well spent to bring you to that. So choose the right fit. Remember we talked about eyeballing the person? You need to know they've got that, you can build a relationship and then you need them to get the expertise at the right level. And getting the right uh, professional depends on the volume of the work involved.